Hey, uh, so earlier uh, this month, two speakers, I gave a tiny talk on talking, and I said, make sure you end 10% early, and I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to bring you that hypocrisy right here on stage. Sorry. Blooming on the battlefield, relationships, rivals, and romance through gameplay. Click. Nope. Uh, Spacebar. Okay, so yeah, who's this? Uh, I'm Jim Shepard, like the commander. I make games about crushing monsters and taking their stuff. I've been doing this for a long time. My pride and joy is this game, Dungeon Mans. Uh, you all played it, or you weren't able to buy a ticket. Noah told me that was the case. I've helped, <laughs> I've helped make uh, Tangle Deep, uh, Andrew Averse's game. I also ported it to the Switch. And soon I'll help my man Patrick over there work on Autofire, which is going to come to Kickstarter in January of next year. Very exciting. That is a car PG roguelike. Uh, over here is my awesome fiance, Allison. And sometimes her and I go dancing. And we also have a lot of Dungeons and Dragons hosted parties at my house. That's me. And also this. Now, uh, thanks to the Peppers Proc Gen Practitioner partitioning pattern, look at me. I'm a sorcerer. Right. Uh, I bend procedural generation by force of will. That's me also. But I'm also a banner man because I'm a champion of the cause who flies the flag proudly and leads others to victory. So cool. That's me. All right. Uh, so <laughs> you should be clapping for Alexi because. Man, she lit this whole place on fire with the first talk. That was amazing. All right, well, what's going on? So I'm in here to show you guys some things. We're going to talk about techniques to define relationships with NPCs and what that, if the effects of those relationships on the player. I've got some examples, and I've got some, some concrete concepts, of course. And the reason for this is because it's really cool fuel for your proc gen systems. I believe that wholeheartedly. I think this also lets us do things during gameplay rather than outside it, and I'm a big proponent of that. Uh, so here's the status quo, right? It's reputation, faction, renown. You meet somebody or a group of somebodies, and they don't know you because your reputation is zero, so you're unknown. And then you kill some people they don't like, and you bring back some pelts that they like, and you give them money, and you say things they like, and all of a sudden, you're exalted, right? You're the... <laughs> You're like their favorite person ever, right? You went from, from somebody they couldn't care about to like the best human alive. And, and that seems a little silly to me, but it makes sense when you think about games that have this, uh, you need to keep it simple, because they have like dozens of these, right? There's just so many. So you've got all these different <laughs> reputations to keep track of. There's a ton. So if you have a bunch of different numbers per thing, that's, that's going to be too much. Uh, so typically, these are straight lines, one exciting dimension of travel, and it's simple. I do believe uh, we can do a little bit better. I want to ask about relationships. The first part is, do they like you? Do the person enjoy your company? Do they feel a kinship with you? Do they think you've been good or kind or fair to them? Now, every NPC has different responses to the different questions. Some matter more than others. That's fine. That's up to you. This is something you're already used to. It's a straight line. Uh, it starts in the middle where they don't know you and maybe they don't care, and then it can drop to bad, they don't like you, it can go up to you rule, they think you're great. This is something that's not rocket surgery, but something a lot of games don't do, I think we should do more often, is apply this to our foes, right? This can be something that an enemy has. So it's just because somebody has an opposite goal from you, they can still like you, right? Also, your allies can think you're a jerk, right? That's a thing that works as well. So I'm going to give you an example of this like-dislike for foes in gameplay with this right here. Who's this here? This is Wesley, the Dread Pirate Roberts, the man in black. He has one goal to rescue the princess, right? So he shows up and has three main points of opposition in the beginning of his story. The first is, somebody say his name, and prepare to die. Y'all, if you guys don't know this movie, get off my lawn. Maybe this is, I'm too old now. Uh, so. Uh, when he meets, when Wesley meets Inigo Montoya, he's climbing up a cliff, and Inigo says, I swear on the soul of my dead father, you'll get to the top alive. He climbs up, they sit down, they start exchanging gear scores, they talk about the life of being a cool fighter guy, and then they have a sword fight. And they're both so happy. They're doing the thing, they're playing with each other. I'm not left-handed, it's great. And when this fight goes on, you can tell they're enjoying it. Wesley wins, Inigo says, kill me quickly. Wesley says, I'd sooner destroy a stained glass window than an artist such as yourself. He likes this foe. So he pulled his punches, he showed mercy, and there was an opportunity for future positive encounters, but he still had to win, right? So the next foe is Fezzik, Andre the Giant. We're going to skip that and go to the Sicilian. The Sicilian is somebody Wesley didn't particularly care for or care about. So he's sitting there with the princess, and Wesley could have just like jumped over the stump and stabbed him to death, but he didn't. He instead decided to just kind of flex on him, do, oh, we're going to have a game of wits, when the wits is, don't drink either cup, but the Sicilian didn't. He died. 
this is kind of just average for Wesley, right? This is somebody he didn't, well, I mean, he kind of didn't like him, I don't know. Like, he didn't really think very highly of this person, but also it wasn't anything to make him lose his cool. So then they go, he, he's got the princess, and they go through the swamps of sadness, and they fight the womp rats, and then they get to the next part, which is these guys, the toolbox brigade on horses, and he hates them, right? Two nobles ambushed, there's like five crossbow dudes around him, there's one dude's got six fingers, like he's just totally not happy, and he loses his shit, right? He yells, death first, and he was so cool like a cucumber for the rest of this stuff, now he's ready to go into a fight where he lost initiative and it's gonna be terrible. The princess says, no, 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 hold on, we need a movie, and she lets herself get captured. When your foe hates you, there's irrational behavior and extra aggression. All of these situations are things the players can take advantage of and use to build uh, success for them. So how do you make a foe like or dislike you uh, when you're playing? And during a conflict when you're actually fighting them, uh, the things you do in the fight, your style, your technique choices might impress them, might not. If you have a chance to talk to them, throw taunts back and forth during a fight, that could happen. Critical decisions, uh, if there's a hostage to rescue or if there's uh, a timer happening and there's a thing to grab off an altar or do you show them mercy when they're defeated? That's important. And also maybe what you're wearing is cool. Right? If you show up in ostentatious armor, maybe they're gonna dig it. Outside of a fight, mainly that's what they know of you is what others know of you. Your reputation with that will precede you. If you are a tunnel snake and they hate tunnel snakes, right, then that's not gonna work for them and they will dislike you from the start and maybe your cool-ass outfit will help as well. Uh, so that's fine. Maybe they like you, maybe they don't. Is that enough? Of course not. Uh, do they respect you? This is a different question, or a different series of questions. Do they think you're good at your job, right? Do they think that you uh, handle difficulty well? Are you a survivor? Do they think your methods make sense? Again, every NPC is different. This is something, depending on, you get more questions than answer this, uh, but do they respect you? Look, it's another number line, right? It starts in the middle, where they don't know anything about you. Now, some people will say, well, I have a default respect for everybody that I don't know. Other people are like, unless I have to respect you, I won't. So that's based on the NPC's personality. Um, and the endpoints matter too. Are you someone that's on their side or not on their side? Do they think you're better than them already? Are you more junior? And these two values can move alongside each other. But we have to remember that they are two different distinct values that are not linked. So they must interact in some fashion, and I'm going to nail them to a cross. Great. So now we have a grid, and everybody likes grids, and we have two exciting dimensions of reputation. Uh, every one of those points could be something. I'm just going to hit the endpoints. I think these are, uh, these are worth discussing. These are some interesting things for actual gameplay. You could go all over the board. It doesn't matter. Uh, I think actually the compass points matter too, but that's fine. How, why do they matter, and how do they change? I think why do they matter is probably first. Uh, here we go. You have a mission, right? You have to sneak into Castle Blue and rescue the Red Prince, and you're like, oh snap, I'm gonna do it. Let me call on my contacts for aid. Friends and foes alike, people you have a relationship with, maybe they can help you. So we'll start with somebody who likes you and doesn't respect you. Okay, this person, well, you're not gonna win, right? They think of you as like, uh, who? You know, they don't want you to die. They respect your positive attitude, and they don't necessarily have malice against you, but they know you're not gonna do it. So if you say, hey, listen, can you give me some gold? They'll say, sure. Can you, hey, can you give me this plus one assault rifle? They're going to think, that's just going to end up in some enemy's inventory, right? They, they know <laughs> that it's not worth it, so they're not going to do that. And if you go to an enemy who's not on your side, a foe, and say, hey, listen, can you put some shit yourself powder in the guard's soup tonight? Why would they risk it? Because they think you're going to die anyway, right? They're going to do a bad job. But on the flip side, if they really like you, and they know if they put shit yourself powder in the guard's soup, the guards won't be as aggressive, and maybe you'll survive and just get to run away. So that might be a decision they make. Somebody who likes you and respects you, though, this is awesome. They think highly of you in all regards. They're with you all the way. And if you need anything, they'll give it to you. And if you want to go fight, they'll come with you. And it's the best. If a foe likes you and respects you, they may take risks to help you. And they know you're a threat, right? They know you're, you're serious business. So in this case, you know, maybe they'll flip sides. If they like you enough, maybe this is where they turn on you. Or maybe this is where they prove they can finally beat you, right? And I'm, I'm really looking forward to this moment, because if you build up a true rival as a foe who likes and respects you and create a great conflict on a mountaintop somewhere, I, that's, that's boss. So I want that to happen. Doesn't like you, but respects you. This is somebody who's an adversary. And you've got to think about this. You probably know this idea, where you look at somebody in their work, and you can't argue with their results, but you don't like their attitude. 
right? Or what they say or how they say it. You, know, you can go, well, gosh, it's, it sold a bunch of copies and it's really pretty. The Witness is a great game, but <laughs> whatever. So an ally here is supporting the mission, but not you, right? If you fall down a hole and die, they don't care as long as the mission's a success. A foe that you, why would you talk to somebody who's not on your side and doesn't like you? They will do whatever they can to beat you because they know you're a threat unless you're so strong on, against them that they know they can't beat you. And then they'll do what you ask them to do, but they will hate you for it, right? And if somebody doesn't like you or respect you, why are you talking to them at all? You are beneath notice, you're a joke. They have no desire to help you. They'll probably try to stop you if they're an ally. Like, oh, you have to rescue the prince? Uh, hold on, like, go let me do that instead because you're gonna do a terrible job and they don't want you to go. A foe who doesn't like you and respect you wants to kill you on sight probably anyway, but you're beneath contempt to them. They don't think you matter to their plans and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe if you can convince a serious bad guy that you're worthless and they don't like you or respect you and then you surprise them when you're not left-handed, that could work in your favor. So we have these like and respect values and they determine two things, the response to requests and behavior during critical events. And that's cool, but how do we get these values to move around, right? So here's another example. Let's build up a party. We're gonna have allies in the dungeon. When people come with you, every NPC views your actions, the gameplay events, through their own personality lens to create a unique opinion. So let's roll. Who are we gonna bring with us today? We are gonna bring on, let's see, we'll bring on this guy. Yes, I want him. And we'll also bring on this guy. Oh, perfect, the two people I wanted to talk about, great. They're gonna come <laughs> along in the mission. So we have two uh, NPCs who are gonna party with us. There's a paladin and a rogue. They're pretty standard if you know the archetypes. Both of them are on your side and friendly to you. Um, the rogue is selfish, but you know he wants to win, he wants the team to succeed. The paladin is tanky spanky, might makes right, totally uptight, prideful to a fault. Here they are. They're gonna roll with you, and here's the first example. Okay, you're in a dungeon and you're fighting a terrible monster, the paladin's tanking and the rogue is shooting and you're like, well, you know, I can get around there. You see it, right? There's an opportunity to go flank. So you do that and, whoa, hey, there's some gold here. And they don't, they're busy, right? So all this treasure, you scoop it up. Of course you do, because that's what we do when we play the games. Do you split it with them when the fight's over? Well, let's just say yes. So when you do that, what does the party think? Well, the paladin's happy to get paid. I mean, who isn't? He'll probably just pour it into the church's coffers, but that's fine. However, he respects the idea that you are traditionalists. It's shared danger, shared reward. We're all in it together. He's from the old school, and gosh, so are you. He claps you on the back, and that's great. The rogue loves getting paid, of course. You give the rogue gold, he's very happy with you. He can spend it on all sorts of things, but he thinks you're a sucker, right? <laughs> you found that money in the corner, and he didn't. He wouldn't have done it for you, right? So he doesn't really think you're, you're really savvy. It's not that he dislikes you, he'll buy you a drink, but he thinks you're kind of a sucker for that. All right, so something else in the dungeon. Now, the paladin takes a critical hit and loses 20% health because he's so tanky, a critical hit doesn't matter. And we're watching this happen. And you, okay, well now it's the player's turn. And, oh, I got this. You reach into your scroll pad and you heal him. You super heal him, you way over heal him. You use a very powerful consumable that would have taken him from zero to 100 and he's totally topped off. What does the party think of that? So the paladin, uh, in terms of like, is probably a little insulted, right? Like, I'm at 80%, come on. You know, that's what he's there for. I could just lay on hands and do this. Like, why are, you, why are you wasting a potion on me? But he's really angry that you take a scroll that strong and you blow it on a tiny wound. And he's gonna say, give me the scrolls, I'm in charge now of these. Like, you don't get to have them anymore. And that's gonna really make him upset. The rogue likes laughing at the angry paladin, right? And he likes that you watch out for the group. But he respects survival first, right? How many of us have died with huge bags full of consumables? You can't spend it when you're dead. He knows that, and he thinks it's fine that you did that, and he knows that if he parties with you, he's more likely to come out alive. That is something he respects. All right, so personality flags on our NPCs. Respond to gameplay events to adjust like and respect values. Like and respect values determine interaction responses and behavior during critical events. Just some examples, write them all down in your copy book. Here are some things that can be uh, character flags, and then here are some events that can happen. They're not one-to-one, -one, but they're just things that exist out there. You can make a whole bunch of them. And really, I mean, is it more than bit fields? A little bit, kind of, but this is just stuff that can respond to game events. Because of that, 
cool stories can just happen, right? And usually, when you think about neat game events, there, there are things that we may end up scripting with maybe, you know, uh, hard-coded NPCs. This stuff can be procedural, right? So you can have an ally who tosses you a potion and abandons you when you're wounded, because you just hold the mission back. He likes you but doesn't respect you. You've got 15% health and you're crawling to pick up your other arm. And he's like, look, here's a Band-Aid and I'm out, right? You just stay here, I'll go rescue the prince. Uh, enemies will respond to you in different ways if they like you. Maybe somebody knows you're powerful enough to deal with, even though you're kill on sight to that faction. And I like the one about the shopkeeper, grumbling every time you show up. Maybe you did something to his daughter, whatever, he doesn't like you, but he knows how strong you are. He knows you'll do the campaign well, so he'll sell you his best stuff at like four times the price, right? That is like and respect moving around with the blacksmith. But this talk is titled Relationships, Rivals, and Romance, right? So there's a whole other aspect here. Um, this is perhaps the most challenging interactions with NPCs, or maybe the easiest. <laughs> We have to define romance in terms of gameplay, right? That's hard to do, but we're gonna try it. What is love? So um, in the context of this talk right here, just for this, this is my definition of it. A desire for long-term intimacy of any type that is paired with a need to feel desired in return. It's specific and generic at the same time. Long-term intimacy is important to me. I know there's a trend in games now that any organism can hump any organism. Awesome, right? That's cool, that's very easy. You know, you don't need to think about tracking love if things are just going to hook up and bang all the time. That's simple to do. I have, I don't make it a technical talk, I have the source for that, right? And you can take this. <laughs> if you want it, it's yours, right? Go for it. Yeah. Long-term intimacy of any type. Again, uh, this is something that brings real challenge, right? High rewards if you do it right. But a player may not like this. A player may think, man, I don't need, you know, mushiness in my monster crushing game. And so this could be something that makes some people upset, so you must ask first. I believe you should require players to opt in checkbox, do you want romance in your game? Say yes, because they have to agree, because bad things might happen, and then you can remind them, you asked for this, right? <laughs> you asked for this. So, like, when things go wrong, it's, it's not your fault. Why, though, would they ask for this? Like, what's the carrot? If the stick is misery and rain, the carrot is what? So, typically a video game in romance gives you one of two rewards. There's super scripted, tender moments where the hero and the lover finally meet, or there's animu boobies, right? <laughs> Those are the two things. And, and that's not us. That's not what we're gonna do in either capacity. We have the first thing, which I think is probably the coolest, is the highest tier of side-by-side -side combat ally, right? You find a deep romance with somebody, and the two of you are gonna be awesome together, right? And so that person, that person can be just as powerful as you. It can be another player character level strength side by side. You, you read each other's minds, you're doing cool shit together, you're conquering worlds, it's awesome. That is a reward for high level romance. Um, but that can also inspire your party. If you have a guild, a town, an empire, they can see the great heroes falling in love and, and that virtue and they're gonna say, wow, that's really cool, that'll inspire them too. Maybe it'll make some of them jealous. That could be fun, if jealousy is fun. This also creates new moments for your procedural history. You're building these libraries, typically one of the biggest things for players is like, oh, I conquered this guy, or I killed this dragon, and it gets etched on a pot somewhere. But now, you can have a couple that does this, right? The romantic couple, the, the husband and wife, or the husband and husband, or the, the slime and the dog who got together and did whatever, and that's the cool last part is, maybe one of the pair gets killed, right? And the other one can pick up the pieces. So if you start as player A, and player A marries player B, and player A gets run over by a dog, player B can still play and maybe mar marry somebody C. Maybe maybe never get married again. The story can continue. I know, that, where are you? That's not permadeath, please boo me. Are you still here or did you go home? <laughs> All right, fine, don't boo me, I'll take it. So now let's let's make romance miserable, right? Let's, let's kill it by converting it to a float value, right? <laughs> So it's just a number. It starts at no desire or attraction and ends up at like maximum thirst. And there's a whole bunch of human-ish emotions that happen when uh, you're feeling this, but we're gonna try to keep it as an average, right? So the excitement of somebody new, it's like, oh, you're so hype and oh my gosh, and your hearts are fluttering, but it's only kind of new, and if it goes away, it's not the end of the world, that's lower on the scale than a long-term relationship where you're still full of love, you're still so happy to see them, but it's not the same crazy go nuts energy, right? That still counts higher in this system that I'm talking about here. 
Uh, does this add a third dimension? I have a cube of romance and feelings. Maybe, right? It's tough to think you're going to have real affection for somebody you don't like or respect. There are stories where you get super hot for somebody you hate. That's fine. That's not really in the scope of this year. So how do you have NBZs build affection, right? The first step is, well, maybe um, you see them doing things and uh, they see you doing things, and if they're inclined to fall for you, they might a little more every time they have an opportunity to like you or respect you. So when you're doing stuff and they see it, they're like, hey, right, that, that can matter. And if you pick up on that as a player, you can do it more. They're judging you based on how you interact with others, right? The same thing about taking out a date and then being crappy to the waitress. Like, you're screwed or not screwed. Like, it's just not going to work. You have to be good to people unless your date is mean. Or if your date is mean and terrible and you're mean and terrible, they're going to like that too, I guess. So <laughs> look at what the NPC is doing. Look how they fight. Look what they're carrying. Look at the way they act. Because also, you can ask them out. Oh my gosh, that's terrifying, right? You're going to show them that you're interested and hope they are too. And so you got to see their behaviors and you make choices that match those patterns. And this is something where if we do this as developers, we have to make it very clear. It's already frustrating enough in real life. And you go home and play a roguelike and you're like, does he want flowers? Does he want this sword? Does he want this trophy? Oh, he doesn't like anything. And so you have to make it clear what they're looking for. Uh, guesswork is not gameplay. And be careful when they fail. So if someone, if you're like, well, this person likes flowers, and you give them flowers, and they're like, nay, my mom died from floweritis, and they like, <laughs> and now that's it, you've screwed your opportunity there. I mean, I guess that's permadeath, but that, that's no fun. Let's not do that to our players. So now when NPCs have affection for you, remember that the definition includes a need to feel desired in return. Typically, NPCs that have romance, and oh, these games that have them, a whole bunch of them are like ready and willing, and you pick one, and you have the cutscene, and the rest go, all right, fine, and they just deal with it, but man, that ain't life. That's not how it goes. If an NPC is into you, and you're not returning it, they may behave differently, right? And this is on the battlefield. This is in interaction. This is wherever you are. They might do things that are weird and distracting, and you have to decide, well, am I into them too, or do I cut them from the group, or do I, do I hook them up with somebody else, right? That's something you might want to do to fix it. And also, when you are playing these games, all the NPCs, right, are like on parade for you. You pick one. They're sitting in the window, right? Which NPC do I like the most? Do I want to see the cutscene with? And that's really cool, but you know what? That isn't, that's not our games, because in our games, this might happen. Oh no, right? You've met somebody, and now your character has affection for someone. The player did not ask for this. They didn't say, I want this to happen, but it happened. And so now the player has combat debuffs. Maybe you're really sleepless nights. You want this person, but do they like you too? And you don't know. And I just shut up, Goblin. I'm thinking about serious things. <laughs> Maybe you have difficulty communicating with them because you're stuttering and you can't really get the words out, what you want to say. <laughs> and so it's difficult to keep the controller there. And it's just, yeah, that's a situation that happens. So you know what? It's not fair. I mean, all's fair in love and war, but it's not. Highest highs, lowest lows. Romance can bring you a whole bunch of things Maybe player thinks, I didn't want to have affection for somebody, and now I do, now I have to cut them from my group. Man, you know what else sucks is like starving and mistranslating a scroll and all this other stuff. But you can remind the player with romance, you asked for this, <laughs> right? That's it, that's all I got. Thank you very much. We're not over. I'll ask questions. Ask questions. Cool. I thought we were like way over. Hit me. Um, I was interested by your saying, could it be a cube or could it not be a cube? Right. And where my mind went at first, which I would like for you to comment on, is in certain games, magic is used to charm people Ooh. and make people oh, feel yeah. affection for you, even though they are your enemy. Oh, and then conversely, right. they're like suck you by and in D&D yeah. &D and such, who, who make you feel things that you shouldn't be feeling. Right, um, right, yeah. That, those values of like and respect and affection can be moved around through magic. Horrible, right? And then when you do that and it wears off, it swings in the other direction. Now that's, that's, that's tricky. Uh, but it would work, right? If these mechanics are open to the game and they're part of the procedural engine, then why not? Uh. Um, I was wondering how much you've thought about the added dimension of you have these states, but how do you communicate those to the player or how do you hide them from the player? You could have somebody who's just icy cold and disdainful but is clearly crazy about you or 
the guy who's like, no, we're buds. And the guy's like, I'm going to kill the first one. <laughs> hey, how's right. it going? Right. No, that's good. Uh, I believe in transparency and information just because it makes the player choices easier. But when you come to emotion and somebody's like, I really don't respect you, but I'm going to play nice, that is the thing you have to pick up on. And honestly, that requires some probably clever work on the developer part to make sure that you get the impression that person is sketchy anyway. And if you have an NPC who's giving off sketchy traits, or you happen to have enough uh, personality and charisma to detect sketchy on their character sheet, right? Maybe, uh, maybe that would save you from there. But that's a good point. Um, this sounds really great, all of it. But also, it sounds like it would require a lot of writing, which is cool. But like, do you have any ideas for how you would carry out these sorts of relationships, uh, either romantic or the non-romantic type, where the like, respect and like and that sort of thing, uh, in a way that is more feasible to someone who isn't like writing a million words for a game and that sort of thing like or like in, right. a, in a more straightforward way that's like more gameplay oriented but still clearly communicated yeah i'm i'm with you so uh it's silly this isn't silly i'm going to say it like you could do this with emoji right you know hearts pop up question marks frowns angry you know sort of stuff and then that's all the stuff that the the characters are giving you and then maybe somewhere else you can read what the definition is of that but that's all you need to see. So two people who have totally different dialects might say like, thou art a scumbag, or like, oh, douche, why? But if, if you're just <laughs> bringing it to emojis and they just have a big frowny and a poop, then that's, that's all you need for that. So you talked about in the romance section how you want it to be you know, clear and guesswork isn't gameplay. It seemed to me like in your previous part with the example of the paladin and the rogue, the like granularity of event that they were reacting to was so low that in a single adventure you'd have like thousands of these events. Is th was that something that you intended or was it just to kind of explain the types of things that could cause these you know, like respect changes? Yeah, very good point. It's a possibility set, right? So there's a lot of things that can happen, but if it turns out your game isn't something where splitting treasure is an issue, don't do it, right? I just think that there's a really cool uh, bit of science there for personality flags to match with game events. It's really up to you uh, making something and, and refining it to say, well, what events actually matter and what do players trip over often? And if there's something that a player does all the time that's always sending the numbers to be screwy, you, you just don't do that. You find a way around it. What do you think about um, the possibility of having like emotional intelligence as an axis for this. Like maybe it could be something as simple as just like a boolean. You know, like you have a trait that you select at the beginning of the game, because uh, you're talking about um, like having negative effects on your player uh, as a consequence for having you know like unrequited love. It doesn't necessarily have to be you know like a debuff. Like for example, in real life, you could find being around somebody that you care about like motivating or you know like exhilarating or something like that. I'm I'm with you on that. My personal red flag for that is, you said axis, so now we're in the W dimension, right, of like four things to consider. But even then, the idea of like, oh, well, I have the flag of like, you know, stone-hearted. So if I'm really hot for someone and they don't feel me, I don't care. You look into the distance and the wind blows through your hair, like, <laughs> cool. Uh, th if that level of complexity fits the game, do it. I think, again, in the beginning, people, when they do faction, you do one number. So having, th we have three numbers now. We have like, we have like and respect and perhaps affection. That's three times as hard, but it's still not an order of magnitudes. It doesn't even count in the long run, right? That's O-N, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up one interesting one. Um, the game doesn't have the depth of what you were talking about, but um, Arcade Ganon in Fallout New Vegas is an interesting one, I think, because the only way for him to have a positive future at the end of the game is to not let him help you in the final battle of the game. Oh, wow. So, that, so I think that, because he's part of a faction that everybody hates, and if you have him help you, then everybody finds out, and he generally gets killed. So oh, I think wow. that was an interesting uh, sort of, you send him away, and he survives, but he doesn't, he's not happy with you. Right, thank you. You know, that, that's really cool. I haven't played through uh, New Vegas. I do think, though, that, that in cases like that, it's cool if the player can understand during gameplay what they should do to make the happy ending. And maybe they can't, maybe they did a bad job. I know that there's a game out there, Tyranny, which I've played some of, which does uh, love and then fear also. 
So when you have somebody, it's how much do you, how much do they love you, how much do they fear you? And they're not on a cross, they're both in tandem. And it's a game about being the bad guy. So you want them to love you the most and fear you the most, which is kind of weird, but I guess that's the game. And so I do want to point out though that they do have multiple axes of, of, of feels. Cool, thank you so much. Thank you all very much.